Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, and today's episode is based on minutes 91 through 95 of Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. In this set of minutes, Poe instigates a mutiny against Holdo, DJ Finn and Rose infiltrate the Supremacy and put on First Order uniforms, and Kylo brings Rey to Snoke's throne room. Joining me today is Adam Liebrick Johnson, a trombone player. I believe you play bass and tenor, right? Tenor trombone? That is correct. And he is going to significantly bolster my discussions around brass <laughs> and winds. So I'm really excited because he's excited about these minutes too. There's a lot of great brass stuff going on. And hopefully by the end of this episode, you will be more in the know as well. Hi, Adam. I'll, I'll do my best. Hello, how are you? I'm really glad that we're finally talking. Me too. I've enjoyed listening to you on Star Wars Minute before, and I really enjoy uh, your musical endeavors. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that, I know that um, a long time ago you had mentioned that throne, like various throne rooms, or at least one of the throne rooms, has like one of your favorite trombone parts or maybe brass parts and I don't actually don't think you meant from this movie but here we are again going back to the throne room yeah I think uh, the, the the throne room in uh, Return of the Jedi has some great brass parts in it I mean but like this whole set of minutes uh, has some really typical John Williams tension music which has yes. a lot of uh, trombones playing block chords softly and then horn stings and trumpet stings and stuff like that it's 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 really interesting to listen to how he weaves all that stuff through the uh, through the minutes. Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting that. So you're, the way that you described those brass textures, you mentioned three separate things. You mentioned the like chordal pads, right, as one yes. thing. Yes, and that, that's that's typically what the trombones do through these types of things. Do you mean like this stuff? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. And so those would be lower in pitch because trombone yeah. is lower in the scheme of brass instruments. Yep. And then the trumpets are doing the stings. Yeah. And then there's, there's, there's in this one, it's, it's mostly French horn sting. That's, you know, a lot of the, ba -ba, mm, bum, okay. ba -ba, you know, that kind of stuff in between the phrases. And, is sting uh, it, it, a typical word that you would use to describe that? Like in the uh, brass it's world. It's one that I would use. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It is definitely one that I would use. It, it's it's generally. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's a standardized term or not, but I've always used it. It's it's basically it's it's uh, it means an accented uh, hit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, that is sort of an interjection between other phrases. I like that. I'm going to add that to my vocabulary. I definitely hear sting as well. I hear sting and stab. Yeah, stab. I've heard stabs as well, but I think I think. Uh, at least me coming from the the some somewhat coming from the the commercial and jazz world, uh, sting is probably the the more common phrase. Yeah, I actually think it sounds a little bit nicer too mm -hmm. than stab. But um, I'll let you like. Do you want to go chronologically? Yeah, sure. In this in I mean, these minutes. Yeah, so and, you know this this set of minutes is great because it also has minute ninety four. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at the beginning of this span of minutes. Poe is explaining his side plan to Holdo, who is very unimpressed. Um, he's telling her, you know, what Finn and Rose are doing uh, to disable the First Order's hyperspace tracker. Um, and then she is like, you're putting us in danger. And she orders the transports for departure. And then Poe says, I was afraid you'd say that. And the first thing I noticed after that is the very satisfying gun clicks. Like, yeah. Yeah, like right after he says, yeah, I was afraid you'd say that. Like we hear what the, you know, what his mutineer, fellow mutineers are, they're ready to go. And that you, yeah, we hear them each like get their blaster ready. It's a very visceral, satisfying uh, sort of heavy sound of, of the guns being, being cocked or primed or whatever it is you do with a blaster before you shoot it. Yeah, it's super visceral. It's super visceral. Um, and then she's like, I hope you know what you're doing. And then we get the infamous iron part. <laughs> Which I know that a lot of people don't like that. I love it. It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's a tribute to uh, one of the first Star Wars fan films, Hardware Wars. Oh, is that what that is? 
Yes, uh, in that uh, the fan film, they use various household appliances and uh, other things to make uh, spaceships and such. Uh, for example, R2-D2 is a, is a canister vacuum named Artie Deco in that fan film. And the Millennium Falcon is the Millennium Iron, which, as you think, see, is, a, is an iron flying through space. I did not know that it was a reference to that. Yep. That is cool. Okay. Because I, I was going to say, I don't dislike it, but I don't like, I'm not obsessed with it either. I'm just, I like it. And I feel. I'm not, obsessed. I'm not yeah. obsessed with it. It's just, it's just, I love that it's a, it's, it's paying tribute to the, the, the back to the beginning of Star Wars fandom. Yeah. And now I like it more that I know that. Um, cool. Okay. And uh, it's got a, there's a great little musical uh, bit there too, because it, it, it sort of evokes the original Darth Vader theme. What is the musical fanfare bit? That you'd, it's like. Bum, ba, ba, ba. you know the original fanfare mm. you'd get with uh, darth vader uh entering the uh the rebel blockade blockade runner at the beginning of a new hope is it right when the suits are being ironed like when we see the it's, suits yeah or, pretty much yeah it's like as the iron's coming down and it, it transitions into the suits being ironed oh that's cool um the sound of the steam is also um it's interesting because the sound that sh like ships make when they're landing and then the how they kind of morphed that into the iron steam, it, like it worked more than I would have thought it would work. And well, that's and a sound it's, that it's I sort of a great. Had. It's a great uh, cinematic subversion too. Where you, it sounds like a ship landing, and then yes, yeah, it pulls out. You're like, oh, it's not a ship. Yeah. But it One, also still sounds like an iron the whole time. Yeah, I I love that. Um, something that I've noticed here and. It's happened earlier in the movie too. I just can't remember exactly where is BB-8's melodic beeps. Have you noticed that when BB-8 is, I don't know, scurrying a little bit, he does this. Oh yeah, he's uh, he's, uh, he's trying to imitate a mouse droid. Oh, he's imitate. Okay, no wonder that's such a familiar. Okay, he's, he's imitating a mouse droid because they put the they put the trash can over him, makes it look like a like a giant mouse droid. It's whoa! I, I burst out laughing in the theater when I saw that because and and he he's trying to imitate the mouse droid sounds, but it's in like a different key and it's like different intervals. It's like a tritone in there or something like that. It's it's really weird. <laughs> it's funny. It's like I knew that they were dressing him like a mouse droid, but I didn't like catch that he was aware of that and that he was doing that too. That's like a whole. That's a a level that I had never picked up on. All right, you're teaching me things. One, Thank you. It's one of the reasons BB-8 is one of my favorite droids. He's probably my second favorite droid after uh, after the the murderous chopper from Rebels. Oh, okay, yeah, I can see why. Yeah, if you like BB-8, I can see why you'd like Chopper. Yeah, um, my favorite droid is is C-3PO, but um, well, who who we do get in these set of minutes? So we'll get there. Um, yes. Yeah, you like a mischievous droid. Yeah, and then you know, as they're emptying out the trash can, which I, I also love that there's a trash can in Star Wars because it's just such a mundane thing to have. But of course, they would have a trash can because what? Where else would you dump stuff into the uh, the trash compactor from? Totally. I, I like I like I like bits of the mundane in Star Wars, and th there's a great uh, there's like a four note tuba solo when uh, when they empty the trash can that I really like. It's, it's very it? subtle. It's very soft. Kind of, it's, it's, if I will demonstrate. Let me move the Ooh. microphone back so I don't Our kill Our first me. trombone demonstration. Yeah, so it'll sound a bit different because it's on bass trombone and not tuba, but... Okay, so it's in the score. It's happening on tuba, but you were going to play it on yeah. the trombone. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll play it at the same pitch as the tuba. Okay. Okay, when and exactly it's, does it's, that happen? That's right as uh, Finn is dumping out the trash can and putting it over BB-8. It's just a little bit of a, of a little accented tuba solo right there. That is kind of funny. Okay. Is that when and, the, uh, and the uh, strings uh, are also doing like a... Yeah. Um, does that thing, does that uh, like little phrase that you just played does that come up again throughout this like does it pop up i don't think so i think it's just part of the the sort of uh tension music that is basically through most of these minutes yeah like very clearly yeah, scored it's, for it's, the moment yeah it, it's not it's not super melodic there's not a lot of themes showing up i mean there's a brief uh you know as they're leaving the uh 
the ironing room, there's a brief statement of the uh, the main title theme. Yeah. So and what... then uh, later on, there's a brief statement of Rose's theme, but there's really not a whole lot of themes through this whole set of minutes here. It's, it's just a lot of uh, sort of through composed raising tension music. Um, first, can you explain through composed? Uh, through composed, meaning uh, that it's not repeated, not... Uh, I, I'm, I'm using the term incorrectly uh, because it usually means something. That's why that's, I'm asking uh, you to define it. Cause when I use it, yeah. I th probably don't technically mean it in the way that like romantic, they mean it in terms of romantic composers. So yeah, no, for so your what, own what, definition what, 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 of it. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what I'm basically saying is it, it's, 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 it's not, it's not stating any re repeated melodies or, or, or any, any repeated phrasing or anything like that. It's just sort of scored to the moment, uh, and it is, it, it very much does track what's happening on screen, not to the point of, uh, say, uh, like a cartoon would, would illustrate somebody walking with, with melody or something like that, but it, the, the music in the, the score is definitely demonstrative of what's, of what's happening on screen. You know, yeah, for that's... example, when the, uh, when the turbo lift goes up as uh, Finn and Rose are walking by, the strings do a little ascending tremolo, like, giddy, 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 you know. Yeah, that's how I tend to think of through composed as well, like as opposed to the like when time kind of goes wonky and we hear like a big thing from the soundtrack, like on octo mm -hmm. or like just a sweeping, you know, full orchestral sweeping. You can hum it like it's staying on the same song for, you know, three minutes, yeah. not just like going into one thing and out, of, out to another thing. Yeah, when I use the word through composed, I kind of mean like scored literally to the screen, like. Yeah. Yeah. Which okay. I know is not technically the correct way to use it, but it, it right. fits. Right. So to those who don't know, there's like through composed is a term used that makes sense in a kind of in a more specific context in like Western classical music. And it's as opposed to other um, formats of music. But I think it probably I think it translates just fine to the way that we're using it here outside of the. Yeah. Yeah, outside of the super formal way. Um, well, it's been a long time since my musicology classes, so I'm, same. <laughs> I've forgotten a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> same. Um, I actually noticed a lot of themes throughout here, throughout these five minutes, but really just hints. Like I will get to them, but like I heard that main theme, that hint, and then I heard one of two of Kylo Ren's themes, his hesitant one. I did hear his main theme too, but just barely hinted in the oboe at one point. I heard well, there's Snoke's I, yeah. theme, there's Rosa's theme, there's Resistance March, but they're all just little, they're all just woven into like the through composed nature of this, of th this set of minutes. It wasn't, it's yeah. not like a full on statement. They're most, they're really just tiny hints. The thing that I feel is the, is the thread like weaving all these things together is that sort of incidental motif. Um. Like it's always these three notes, not the specific notes, but you know, the relationship. Um, yeah, like I don't, I don't get too deep into like pitch class, pi <laughs> yeah. pi pitch class theory, but since it just changes so much, I don't want to say it's always like E, G, F sharp. It's always, like zero it, okay if you know pitch class set theory it's zero four three right zero one two three four four three no wait one zero three two one three. and it's okay if i lost people it's just uh basically i'm saying like since it changes so much from here to here you can hear that they're kind of like the same thing. They're just starting on different notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you, yeah, the relationship between those same a, notes will be the same no matter where you start it on the keyboard. And it's a very tense motif. And the, the more you play it, the more tense it feels. Yeah. So I think I may have cut you off by the through composed question when you were saying something. No, it's all right. Don't worry okay. about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so moving on. Now we have, okay. Now we have Ray and Kylo in the transport. 
really interesting scene. Um, a lot of playing with light in that scene. Did you notice that? Like, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, it's so. What do you think of that scene and the music? I, I love that scene. I love that the music through it is. Um, it is very understated, and you you said there's a little bit of Kylo's two of Kylo's themes. Uh, I'm not as familiar with some of the newer themes because I haven't lived with them all my life the way I have with the rest of star Wars, but, um, but, uh, it would make sense to have, uh, since he's sort of the focus of the scenes, even though Ray, Ray is trying to convince him that he'll turn. And it, it's, it's a very interesting way that, that, you know, she says she saw him turn and then he says he saw the exact opposite. It's yeah. really cool. Uh, how they're kind of playing off of each other. Then they, they have wonderful chemistry together. When she whispers, I'll help you, that's like mm -hmm. really, um, <laughs> it's really bold. It's really bold of her. And I just keep looking at her face for like if she'll flinch, but she doesn't. And it's just yeah, like that, the strength that she is show that she always shows when she's speaking to him is just like, um, it wows me. I don't know if you can hear it, but my cat is really upset that I've closed the door here. I can hear it. If you need to um, me go, me take care of that, something. I will just, yeah, I, I'm just going to keep talking. So I think it's interesting that um, even though they're both kind of standing their ground in terms of I'll change you and, you know, she's like, I'll turn you, I'll help you. And he's like, no, I saw your future. You'll stand with me, Ray. Um, even though, like, we don't hear Ray's theme during this. We only hear the hint of Kylo, but... Kylo Ren has really a few different themes associated with him. And the really main one that we usually hear when Kylo is, you know, on a rampage and he's being really dark, we usually hear. And that's the one that I think most people recognize as Kylo's theme. Oh, there's a cat. Do, 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 do. But yes. the one that we hear, even though he's saying, like, his lips are saying, Ray, you'll stand with me. I know what I'm doing. You'll stand with me. We actually hear the theme of his that is more associated with his hesitant moments, with his moments of questioning. It's the same thing, theme that we, uh, like, we also hear it when Snoke is talking to him earlier in the film. And he's feeling really, like, conflicted and... Um, just really uh, like questioning and, um, you know, not really standing with who he is. And uh, even uh, musicologist Frank Lehman calls that his hesitant theme. And it's the well, one that I... It makes sense because he's, uh, he's, Ray, whether or not she knows it, is having an effect on him and making him question things. Exactly. And I think the music by not being like, do, 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 do. I know what I'm doing, Ray. Blah blah blah. blah. Like Ray is uh, Kylo instead is saying like I know what I know what I'm doing. You'll join me, but in in inside he's he's kind of he's kind of intimidated. He's he feels a little bit like thrown off. Um, so he's not as confident as he's trying to portray. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where we get the. Much, a much more hesitant theme for Kylo Ren. And it, it even sounds a bit hesitant, too. Yeah, it's like it keeps, you know, it, it doesn't have um, very many notes in it. It just is kind of like repeating the same like thought loops, like, what am I doing? And it just keeps doing that. It's really interesting that yeah, John Williams did some really interesting things in 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 the sequel trilogy. Some very uh, very uh, unusual things for him to have done. And that that kind of thing is is unusual for him, I think. Yeah, it's such a short. I, I think it's just like such a short phrase. Like the different um, the different distinct moods of themes that he gave Kylo Ren. I think really show um, like the fragmented sort of state of him and of course this is just my interpretation but it's not like 
one bold theme that's like, this is who I am. And that's usually what characters get is like a theme that's very obviously, this is who I am. Um, but Kylo gets like, try a little bit of this, try a little bit of that. We're not sure. We're not going to be too declarative uh, in some of them. So, yeah, that's what I think. And, it, and, you know, I think it fits with Kylo being a different kind of villain than we've seen before in uh, in Star Wars. You know, he's he's not really a mystery. We know where he comes from. We know uh, we know why he's doing what he's doing. Yeah, I think the I think the present I think Kylo Ren's character is sort of jarring almost in that he's not just a like black and white villain. I mean, even though he does like terrible things like he is what does even it mean what does it even mean to be a villain, you know? He's a yeah. Definitely he does bad things that hurt a lot of people. But yeah, I, I always struggle with like calling characters villains because I think who they are as a character is like a separate matter from what they do to impact other people. And that's just how mm -hmm. how I feel is like you could be you know, like I'm a total Thrawn stan. I love Thrawn. Thrawn's like my favorite, one of my favorite characters because I really identify with, with Thrawn. But when I say that, I, I'm not also trying to say that like he was good, like he did good things that, you know, I don't, it's not to diminish the terrible things that he did to the rebellion. Um, so making like a villain more sympathetic, I know is, um, like some people are very against that and some people are very for that. And for me, I think it just, I don't really see another way because, you know, mm -hmm. look at Anakin. Like if we judge him by his character, we could excuse a lot of things, but also, you know, he did a lot of things that he was not accountable for, for a long time. So it's yeah. both, it's, you know, it's not, it's never either or, and Kylo is complicated and yeah. We see light flickering across their faces as they go up the transport. And it's like the canonical explanation is just that there's like holes in the transport. So, you know, yeah. when it just the light changes as they go up the levels. But I think it's so it, it's such an interesting um, thing that they, that they, you know, took care to show is the light and the dark kind of flickering on their faces as they go up the elevator. And, it, you know, certainly it's playing with the concept of light and dark and, you know, um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that it felt like this movie was going for was that there, there's not really a whole lot of difference between light and dark. They, they, you can have light with dark, you can have dark with light and, and it, it, there's, there's, there's no 100% good, 100% bad. Especially, yeah. uh, you know, especially with the character of DJ, he seems like, you know, he's, he's kind of the embodiment of that philosophy. Yeah, I know you are a fan of DJ. I love DJ. Tell me why. I really love DJ. Um, he's, he's presented as sort of a Han Solo type at the beginning. The scoundrel, the, uh, the bad guy who's, who's, it feels like he's at the start of like a Reformation arc. But he doesn't get there. And I love that about him, that he's he's perfectly content to be the, the, the one working on the fringes. He's working for whoever pays him. He, he's, uh, you know, it, it's his philosophy is don't join. And I, it's not it's certainly not, in my opinion, an admirable, an admirable philosophy. But it's uh, it's it's something we I don't think we've seen too much in Star Wars. It's, we people are either good or bad and they switch back and forth. But there's there's never someone there's never someone who's just in the middle and content to be there. And, you know, he, he shows fragments of kindness, uh, for example, when he returns Rose's necklace to her after he uses it to, to open the panel. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point because a criticism I hear of villains when they have a reformation arc is just like, let the, let the villains be like, let the evil people be evil. Like let the bad, like let the bad guys just stay bad guys. But I think the tendency to either like keep people bad or give them a reformation arc, like you're right. I don't see very many, um, middle of the road, like just selfish, like selfish mm -hmm. actors, um, content to stay there. And I, and I love that too. Yeah. And, uh, what the, the other thing I really love is he sort of cements Finn's character arc. 
Mm. Because Finn Finn is presented from the beginning as as a hero, even though he's doing a lot of stuff mostly for himself. He's just trying to escape the First Order because he doesn't like working for them. He's uh, trying to save Rey because Rey is his friend. He was never really part of the cause until he comes back from Canto Bight with DJ and sees D- I think he sees DJ as sort of the uh, the logical conclusion of where he's going. Oh. Like he's afraid that he's going to become DJ, you think? He's going to become something like DJ because, you know, he... By not committing to to a side. Yeah, by not committing. Mm-hmm. You know, Finn, Finn is basically, he's he's trying to save his friend, Ray, because he likes Ray. He's trying to save himself because he likes himself. And he's not, he's, he, he never really was part of the resistance cause until, until Rose showed him how to, how to do that. And I think, I think his encounter with DJ helped that too. Yeah, I think that's important. I, I never really thought that he was afraid he would become DJ, but I think he learned about himself through his judgments and conversations of DJ. Like, yeah, he was like trying out idea. Like he, uh, he just continually tests out his own uh, spur of the moment thoughts and his reactions on t- to DJ. And that's how, you know, by talking about it and by um, having that rapport with him and challenging him, that's how he kind of honed where he wanted to be in this galaxy. Yeah. And you know, it makes sense for Finn because he, he, he didn't really have an upbringing. He was just kidnapped by the first order as a child and raised to be a stormtrooper. Yep. So he's so, learning all this stuff for the first time. Yeah. I do wish that Finn had more music. Yes. I really I agree. do. There's a great moment um, when they're uh, when Poe has uh, is on the bridge and trying to and communicating with with Finn and company, saying, you know, come on, give me something. And, and Finn and Finn says, it's now or never. And then DJ's like, now. Oh, and yeah. like the, the the music the music sort of stops there. There's like there's like one like held note on the on the strings and then when he says now it like continues and it's it's just it's it's a brilliant way to weave the music into what's happening on screen i think okay i wrote really weird notes there but i i tried to write out what the music was okay wait b flat one oh there's a chord cluster there that's what you're talking about okay yeah, I, I, yeah it goes like Yeah, the the the, the it's, the it's brass, it's lower. held out. And that's after yeah, that's after Finn says it's now or never. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's so true. And then he says now, and there's there's that little sound effect trill. And then we get like yeah. a trumpet thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. So going back to um then Snoke gets to greet Ray really quick, really briefly. He says, young Ray, and there's this like harp thingy um, above this Snoke theme, which is, you know, not super memorable, but it's very low pitched and there's singing, of course, you know, very emperor-like. Oh, oh um, yeah, there's so, a, yeah, yeah, the, the, down. the low choir in, 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 Snoke's, in Snoke's theme is pretty cool. Yeah, I always joke that like, if I'm watching Star Wars and there's a choir, I hear a choir, if it's a low choir, that means something evil is happening. And if it's a high choir, that means that someone is meeting their death or they are underwater. I don't remember uh, voice being used much, if at all, in the original trilogy. Except for the Emperor. Except, for, was it used for the Emperor? Okay. And I, I don't recall you being used very much, but it, like... The Duel of the Fates in Phantom Menace was the first time I really re- distinctly remember John Williams' choral music. Yeah, Duel of the Fates really changed. A, like, Duel of the Fates, in retrospect, was really a groundbreaking moment for John Williams' scores in Star Wars. Mm. That was, like, a significant departure. That was something new. That that was, yeah, that was, that was definitely something new. Oh, gosh. I have to definitely, I have to do the prequels at some point. Um, Duel of the Fates is... Yeah, there's a lot to be said about that one. But since then, 
there's still not like a ton of choir, but yeah. there's like a there's a little bit of it. There's a little bit of it here. There's more in the cartoons, I'd say. Um, yeah. And we do get choir toward the end of this film, but um, other than that, it's usually relegated to either Snoke, Emperor stuff, or the diegetic music, the diegetic yeah. part, parts. Oh well, yeah, and then that Snoke choir is so cool because it's just all a bunch of really low voices. I'm sure there's basses singing subharmonics there and stuff like that. Can't can basses sing subharmonics? What do you, what do you mean? It's a it's a vocal technique uh, that some really low basses use. Uh, they especially it, it's it's kind of you see it a lot in like acapella groups. And what they do, I, I'm not I can't do it, so I'm not going to demonstrate it because I'm just a baritone. But uh, basically, they get really close to a microphone, and it's a lot of air, and it's really quiet. And they can like vibrate their vocal cords really slowly at that that way, and, and do a really super low note. Whoa! I just I never I've never heard, it makes sense, but um, is it sort of like the opposite of like whistle tone whistle whistle tones? I I, I am like super not a trained singer, even okay. though I <laughs> sing in a band. But <laughs> um, uh, there's a there's a singer named Jeff Jeff Castellucci, Who and does that? he uh, he who does that and it's it's incredible i love bass singers so uh hearing a really good bass makes me happy jeff castellucci okay i'm gonna have to find a video of that if i find that i'll put a link in the show notes because i i want to hear because uh, i'll, I'll Snoke... send it to you uh I'll, I'll send it to you when we're done cool cool because the the like it's very low notes that yeah. are in snoke's theme like very i can't even it, it's unintelligible if i even try to voice what they are um very just very low very very low um so then we get like a little harp thingy when he's um greeting ray he's like young ray and then it's like a harpish plucky thing welcome mm -hmm. and then we cut to dj and the gang on the supremacy and we get those it, we get like an e minor to g minor triad situation which is a very star wars this is very yep. it's a very empire evil uh, chord progression. And I have never talked about this on the podcast before, but what is, I think one of the things that sounds, that makes that sound so distinct is that the triads, and by triad, I just mean there's three notes in the chord and it is going in the order that chords go in their root position. That's a triad, three notes. And it's going to another triad in root position. See, just another three notes. They're planar triads, which is sort of like, if you, uh, if anyone like knows like parallel fourths and parallel fifths, just like parallel, basically, I mean, it's exactly what it, what, what it sounds like. Like if you were to draw a parallel line between these notes and these notes, Try to try to stay with me. I know. <laughs> I know this is kind of a weird explanation, but it makes more sense. It's like I feel like this is an explanation pe more people will understand than will give themselves credit for. So it's you just exactly start... what your theory teachers told you not to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are just like okay. If you have a, access to a piano, you would just like keep your same finger shape from one chord, one set of one chord to the next chord. And I'll play something that's not that. So if I were playing the same chords, but not with planar slash parallel movement, it would be it would be this. Um, and that's more what we're used to hearing in like classical music, is things voiced in a certain way that makes it sound smoother. Mm -hmm. something like that. So, it is really distinct when John Williams at least it's a at least it's a like trope in John Williams music in Star Wars music to have these this planar triad triadic relationship for the evil stuff. Actually for for like rebel fanfares too, but you know, when it's the these minor chords. So, um it it, it, it kind of sounds a bit older, you know, a little more yeah, uh, medieval. Ancient. 
Yeah. And it and it's 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 very angular. It it, yep. it and it, it is once again like this the, the what I kept saying through this is it, it, it just it builds tension. You know, this this whole five minutes basically builds tension from beginning to end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it starts with them it starts with them uh, landing in the wherever they land on the supremacy and then uh, it comes to right before they get caught by the uh by the first order in the next minute. Totally. And, this is know, when the over, three Yeah. This is when the three different And then over on the resistance side it does basically the same thing with Poe's mutiny and all that. It's, it's just it's all building tension to the begin to the top. Exactly. Yep, it's setting setting it up in in three arenas, three areas. Um mm-hmm. pretty pretty exciting when when that dam bursts pretty soon um yeah so when dj and the gang are on the supremacy we get again more of the do 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 those three notes um the zero one the zero three two if anyone here is a music theory person but if not doesn't matter do 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 um and this is when finn tells rose he knows where the transports are we hear some more string some like frenetic string stuff um, this, is also, this is also the part where I realized DJ is wearing his first order cap backwards. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> which is another reason to love DJ. And I, you know, I forgot to mention another outfit change is like, when did Ray switch to a gray black, like a gray outfit? I think on the Falcon. Okay. When when she left Doc Two. Okay. Because. Yeah, it's all it's all matchy match now. Everyone's in like a mm-hmm. very nice looking gray uh, color scheme ab- on the supremacy. Um, yeah, it's like she got dressed to meet Snoke or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, she's probably been wearing the same outfit for a few days and decided to change before getting locking herself into a tiny escape pod. I would do that too. I don't blame her. Um, so here, a sound detail that I like. And I just love whenever this happens. So I always point it out is when Finn says like into his comm, Poe, we're almost there. We hear the rest of his sentence on the other side filtered through mm-hmm. Poe's comm. So we hear the rest oh, of yeah, it. Oh yeah, I love that yeah. sort of intercutting sound. It, it's it's really a way to build, uh, it, it's a way to build the transition. So you know, you're going from one area to the next. You know, I've, I've, I've done that in some sound design stuff myself too. So it, it's really cool to do that. Yeah, it's it's um, it works so well to just bridge to bridge one scene in one place to another to a completely different location by just the sound by the voice being the through line. Mm. It's it's great. Um, and then we cut. And to... I've always loved Star Wars comm filters too. Like the communications yep. filters in Star Wars always sound so because it sounds like it sounds like they're in World War Two somehow. <laughs> Even though they're you know it, it's Do you it's know a what very World War Two comm sounds sound, sound like. It's just a very old-fashioned radio sound. It's not. It's yeah. not like. Uh, it's not like modern digital uh, communication where, like, you and I are talking across a distance now, and it's crystal clear, as opposed to it's like uh, walkie-talkies. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder why you they know, especially, do that. Especially in the, uh, the the Death Star battle where they have that that sort of ring modulator on it that just makes everything sound kind of garbled and stuff like that. Yeah, I I but love you... comm sounds too in Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then we cut back to Poe on the Radis, and the transition there is that it cuts straight to the Resistance March very briefly. Um, in C Sharp, when Poe is sort of, um, you know, he trying to figure out how to keep his how to keep his guard mm-hmm. in the mutiny, and this is when three PO is like, "I do not want to be part of the mutiny." And Which he's like, sir, I am almost afraid to ask. And Poe's like, good instinct, 3PO, go with that. <laughs> Oscar Isaac is so good. See? I love Oscar Isaac. I, when I watch that scene, I feel uh, so, I feel so much annoyance with Poe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, he's definitely being it's flippant well, and dismissive. Well acted, and... well acted on Oscar Isaac's part. But as someone who's like, why did you disrespect three PO so much? <laughs> I'm I'm like Team Three PO. I'm like it's a, that it's is a long so Star Wars rude. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is kind of a tradition. Yeah, it is a tradition. But 
you know what? It's not a tradition with all of the characters. Oh, wait, am I mis mixing up legends? I mean, I, I feel like Ray is really nice to the droids. Leia is nice to the droids. Luke it's, is nice to the droids. So it's not everyone. It's the it's certain characters. It's it's the Han Solo types. Yeah, it is. Oh, three PO. So, and then <laughs> Holdo breaks free from the fog. I love this scene. I love how this looks. It's it looks so fantastic. dramatic, with all the fog behind her or smoke or whatever it is, and she's like rising from the dead, but not. But she's not dead. But you know, she has her blaster, and she. As she's breaking through, that's when we get the hint, another hint of like the main theme. We get a little perfect fifth interval. Yeah. And if you notice, uh, uh, Laura Dern uh, apparently could not resist saying pew whenever she shot her blaster. You could see it there. Oh. You see her go. <laughs> that's hilarious. Okay. I didn't realize and, that and she was saying that. Uh, it makes me love her so much because that, that's great. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I, I, I definitely want, need to pay attention to that now. Um, so then we hear some more like fast, incisive strings. Um, and then Poe says, seal that door. And as the door seals shut, we the transitional like sound that we hear is like a low brass sting, maybe, coinciding mm -hmm. um, with going to the back to the supremacy. I wrote thump, but now that you've uh, brought up the word sting i think it i'd say maybe it was more of a sting but it was like a low brass thing and yeah yeah you you know what i'm talking about yes and, and having played some transcriptions of john williams stuff i'm familiar with that kind of thing that he does you know he uses the trombones very much as a as a color hmm can you that, speak that sort more of a about colorful that? sting uh he just it it's it's either it's either it's either static block chords like we've had earlier or stings like that. And it's, uh, and it, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of using it to just illustrate. Uh, I've just completely lost my train of thought. I apologize. It's okay. I mean, I wanted to ask you in general, like how does John Williams use low brass or brass? Um, like it's, it, it, there's a lot of stings, a lot of block chords when there's stuff like that is happening. Uh, and then uh, in fanfares, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of counter melody and a lot uh, occasionally melody. In the low you brass, know, for example, because I know trumpets yeah. tend to okay. Uh huh. Yeah, for example, in, in like the throne room scene in uh, in uh, Return a of New the Hope. Jedi. Oh, New Hope. Okay. Uh, no, in a New Hope. That's the one I was talking. Is a New Hope. Oh, you the, mean the, like the, the metal bum, ceremony? Da -da -da. Yeah, uh -huh. the metal ceremony. The there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great trombone counter melody throughout all of that, mm -hmm. and then uh, there's a couple points where the uh, the trombones get the melody, as a uh, unison as the whole section plays in unison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so counter melody would be like if the trumpets are going do 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 do, and then the low brass. Then we, we add on to the, yeah. Then the trombones uh, low brass adds on to uh, that sort of chord as it builds and then uh and then when it's when the trumpet started with their you know bum ba bum bum ba da da you know the trombones are like yep. bum 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 you know that kind of those kind mm. of hits stings and then yeah stings hits stings um and then uh later on i don't remember exactly where it is but the trombones pick up the melody it might be uh it might be in the uh the credit sequence we get the uh do, 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 do. Yeah, we get we get that. And yeah, then later on we get uh, in the credit sequence we get you know the, we get we get to state the uh, the main title theme you know, bum bum We get to play that at one point, which is fun. So the textures that okay, when you said that you've played transcriptions, you mean like um, soundtrack versions or like what do you mean uh, by that? I, uh, I've played one actual like soundtrack cue in a concert once. Mm -hmm. I don't remember which one it was, but it was it was it was basically a photocopy of the actual parts from the from the recording. And then uh, the, he's done a couple orchestral suites of Star Wars music and stuff like that, and I've played that. Oh, very cool! And, the orchestral and, suites are and awesome. So, 
Yeah, and 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 for the most part, it's it's basically uh, it's basically what you see on screen, just with you know endings mm-hmm. instead of transitioning to the next cue. So you can expect pretty much when you are opening a John Williams score and you're about to play it that your part, the trombone part, will have either sustained chords. I mean, you're going to be playing one note in the chord as one person, but yeah. either sustained stuff or accented stuff hits Mm -hmm. do 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 or like counter melodies and sometimes melodies especially in fanfares how does that um, compare oh go ahead no go 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 how does that compare to the trombone's role in like other styles of music or other composers music is it pretty standard uh, that if you're talking strictly classical okay if you're talking strictly classical uh we spend a lot of time counting rests (laughs) And uh, so not playing. Yeah. You know, a lo- lot of composers do different things with trombones. Some people really don't understand the range of the trombone because it, it, the trombone ha- is incredibly expressive. If you know how to write for it, you know we can play beautiful melodies. We can uh, we can play harsh, loud, blatty, you know, noisy things. And a lot of times we're just. An, sort of an auxiliary to like the cellos and stuff, stuff like that. Because you're in a similar uh, range. Yeah, and a lot of composers like to like to just use us for for chords and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, some composers like uh, like Hector Berlioz really know how to write for trombone. Mm. You know, if you listen to the the Symphony Fantastique, um, there's what some part? great trombone stuff through that. Uh, we, there at one point we play the DS Day. Uh, in, uh, I'm trying to remember. I, think, I know uh, that piece very well. What, uh, I'll put a link. I'm, I'll, the... I'll put a link in the show notes to this because okay. I, I think I've brought it up. I, if if I haven't brought this piece up before, I will at some point because um, I'm reminded of it quite a bit in Star Wars for some reason. Yeah. And there's there's a great part in the fifth movement uh of the, the symphony fantastique where it's it's uh, the witch's sabbath and then it breaks into the dse day when it's in its tubas and trombone it's just bum 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 and it's just these big static blocks of sound and it's it's really amazing and uh john williams does stuff like that with trombones occasionally oh it's, it's, that it's sounds epic to play, to play. it yeah. sounds epic to like get to be the person who plays that part oh my gosh um that's very cool so ten the tendency for composers who don't understand trombones would you say you said it's chords and um like things that aren't the melody like uh, trombones out in the open would you say is rarer yeah well for example uh beethoven uh you know the the ninth symphony the trombones don't play until the very end of the last movement and to add more bomb just yeah and it's just it, it's just loud chords mm-hmm. it, there's i mean it's certainly fun to play and it's oh, unless you're playing principal and then you have to come in on a high c out of sit nowhere after sitting for an hour which is right. uh, which is exciting <laughs> um because the trombone hasn't been around as long as like the violin or the yeah flute. well it's uh it dates back to uh to the Renaissance, but it certainly has not been around as long as some or, other instruments. Or maybe it wasn't added to the orchestra yet or something. Because yeah, really a lot of composers the back then, like it seems like they didn't know what to do with. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you see trombone showing up. Uh, Mozart used the trombone pretty pretty well, especially in his Requiem. There's a beautiful oh. trombone solo in the, in the Requiem. Oh, I love the Requiem. In the tuba okay. medium. Okay, okay. Cool. And then the the uh, and then the Kyrie, the trombones are part of that big fugue at the beginning of the Kyrie. Oh, that's a good one. So okay, so if people yeah. want to hear more, you know, about the range of the trombone and what the trombone can do, and what, you know, what just what it even sounds like picking it apart, that would be a good one to listen to. Yeah, Mozart Mozart likened the trombone to the voice of God. Ooh. Which How about uh, that? As a player, I I really appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, the voice of God. That's that's very cool. Okay, so um, another question that I I wanted to get your take on was um, when you are listening to scores, not John, not John Williams Star Wars, because there's a real orchestra. But when you're listening to scores that use virtual instruments, 
software instruments. Can you tell when a trombone is real or virtual? Most of the time, yes. And what are the giveaways? Um, the attacks are the giveaways. How so? Um, are they too like, because why are they too? Yeah, the, yeah, a little bit of that. I mean, especially. Uh, I mean, it's it. Modern sample libraries have gotten a lot better, but uh, but you can hear it a lot, uh, especially in like television in the in the nineties and stuff like when they have a virtual orchestra and uh, the, the the brass accents and, and articulations are always just a little off. You know, it, it's 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 a little too perfect. Oh, okay. And it's a and it's a little bit of a wah instead of a da sort of sound. Yeah. That's how it is. That's how and, I feel about a lot of string samples too. Is it's a it's yeah. a wishy washy start, is what I mean, and oftentimes a yeah. wishy washy ending. But I, I definitely have a I, I definitely and I, I can definitely tell when there's synth strings too because uh, you know there there's nothing really that can replicate human performance yet. I mean I agree, um, and I think with some instruments it's more pronounced than others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, strings, I think, is probably one of the hardest ones to replicate, um, and ones yeah, it, instruments where you're blowing into them as well. I mean, percussion and piano are, are, from what I hear, they they are more convincing. Um, yeah, and uh, really, uh, with brass, sometimes if you uh, if you uh, if you can get away without doing the attack if you're just playing like some block chords or something like that mm -hmm. sometimes you can get away with it and like sometimes I, you can sometimes i get fooled and then i until i hear an attack i'm like oh those are those aren't real uh, trumpets those those aren't real horns and mm. you know for and then uh, other times it's really blatantly obvious like for example uh, several years ago i went to see uh, a live production of the phantom of the opera which uh, has a kind of a huge orchestra for a musical it's it's basically had a full symphony orchestra and for this tour they'd really pared it down it was uh the, the brass consisted of one trumpet and one horn oh and i think maybe one trombone or maybe they didn't have any trombones and um the rest of the the rest of it was filled out with synth and you could really hear it oh, that's certain awkward parts. Because because Andrew Lloyd Webber really uh, played with the orchestra in that production and uh, used the instruments, you know, like a classical composer. Oh, that is like the, I'm getting awkward vibes just thinking about that because um, I almost feel like it, it would have been better to just use all synths rather than yeah. rather than introducing one um, one live player. But you know, just, what do I know? Hire local musicians. I, yeah. I'm with you on I'm with you on that. Um, I, I like I ask you these questions because I obviously technology is changing not only the way things sound but also just like in a in a feedback loop the way that things are being written, and so yeah. I think that's why we don't hear as many exposed naked <laughs> trombones in mm. a lot of scores, and same with like. Uh, lots of solo woodwinds or strings unless you were to hire like a, a live player just for the solos or something but it's a lot harder to um, write music that is anything other than lots of pads lots of thick layers and mm -hmm. um, if you're using completely virtual even though like they're getting better like there are some they're getting really really good in terms of thick textures and like really big stuff. And if you're not having to pay attention to too many fine details at the beginning and end. Yeah. And the, there's, there's definitely a lot of, uh, there's a lot of scores nowadays that, that sort of depend on that to sort of hide, uh, hide their virtual instruments. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think one of the really, one of the really good composers to really combine actual orchestral instruments with electronics recently was uh, uh, Ludwig Göransson for the Mandalorian mm -hmm. because he uses electronics as electronics. I, I mean, he's not trying to like, he's not trying to make virtual instruments. He, there's an orchestra too, and he's combining the electronics and the orchestra and it works really effectively. I was like, just writing myself a note about this yesterday. 
and right before we got on recording, I was like playing the Mandalorian stuff because I'm really interested with like, when I listen to that soundtrack, I'm really interested how like I can tell when there's uh, like orchestra and when there's not, but also I was thinking that I do like electronics in music when they are electronic, when they are obviously synths. Like I, lo I love yeah. synths as synths, like not when they're trying yeah, to pretend like there's something else. <laughs> the classic, anal classic analog synthesizers are their own class of instrument and then th there's a place for them and they, they, they work extremely well in that place. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah, I think you, that's, I think that's cool. Listen to say like Wendy Carlos is switched on Bach and it's, it's a oh. brilliant recording. Yeah. Oh gosh. I'm gonna have to link to that too. Yeah. That, that is like, <laughs> sorry, I'm making more work for you. <laughs> it's, it's going to be more, more delight for the, for the listeners who actually want to go on these mm -hmm. um, like rabbit holes, because I think um, I'm, I'm sort of an everything is connected type of person. So um, yeah, if you want to hear like Bach keyboard, Bach being played on very obviously like a synth, synthesizer then you'll definitely have to uh, check out wendy carlos's what's it called switch on switched on bach switched on bach yeah it's really great um so thank you for indulging me on on that we're moving th right through the scene now um supreme okay oh yeah the electronic sounds like when when uh dj is slicing into the first order the oh yeah the stuff classic star wars pops and yep. electronic fizzes and stuff like that it's great stuff yeah and i think as i watched that like what exactly is it that is making those noises um okay i mean i guess they're doing stuff that makes and like uh electric like a shocking sound and okay yeah i guess he's doing something dangerous there um but uh, yeah i love probably, it uh that's probably that's probably all foley mm -hmm. um and there's there, there's uh I, I, I used to know more about Foley than I do because I've done Foley a couple times. Oh, yeah. Um, for the, for those that don't know, Foley is uh, recording live sound effects um, for use in a, in, in a production. Um, for example, uh, you can Foley footsteps by having somebody walk on an actual surface to mimic what's happening on screen. Um, and that's, that's just a term for, uh, for, re for, it's a sound design term for recording sound effects rather than pulling something from a library. Yeah, and also as opposed to filming it and having all of the things literally picked up at yeah. that same time. Because, you know, if you're filming, the mics are going to be closest to where the dialogue is and you're going to probably not hear all the tiny little things as much. So you, you amplify that with Foley oftentimes, mm -hmm. sometimes. And so I, yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure the sounds of the DJ fiddling with the, uh, that panel is, is probably a little bit of library sounds, a little bit of Foley. And uh, and you know stuff like that. I, I I should have looked up who did the sound design for this film because it's not Ben Burke. Re I don't think. No, it's uh, Ren Kleiss and Matthew Wood. Okay. And then some other Foley artists too. Like those are just the supervising sound editors and. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I watched a I watched a featurette a while back about how they made the porg sounds because yeah. I love porgs. Yeah. And that, it, it's that was so a cool interesting one. that it's like it's like a turkey call sped up and then like a duck call with and a chicken and, and also with the with human. Emulating yeah. a chick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. Um, yeah, so those classic Star Wars zip, zippity, zoop, bloop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, very, much like, uh, very much like Han Solo trying to hotwire the bunker in Return of the Jedi. Yes. Maybe they pulled from the same library. Um, mm -hmm. We're running out of time, and then almost time. And then we get back to Poe and 3PO. 3PO, where do you think you're going? <laughs> <laughs> and this is when 3PO, my fave, <laughs> saying it's yeah. quite against my programming to be a uh, party to a mutiny. Um, it wouldn't and be proper protocol. It is not correct protocol. That's right. That's what it is. I <laughs> love a him. Droid. And I love 3PO. I just love C3PO. And then the door starts disintegrating, and he's like, oh, neither is this. So he's kind of in a bind of this is not mm -hmm. protocol, but. Um, there's no good option for me. I really feel for him in this moment. I feel for him. Um, but then we, this is sort of like toward the end of the minutes is like the cuts are happening sort of quicker. So we're going from one scene, yeah. you know, we're cutting between them at a more rapid pace. So now we're back again, to building that tension. Exactly. Um, the supremacy again. And this is the, it's now or never, which we already talked about. 
And then, you know, yep. yeah. Pretty much the end of the minutes. I mean, we get back to Poe and Connix getting ready with their blasters um, to, you know, defend themselves, I guess. And there we get... And then finally, the the final glimpses that we get in this five minute chunk is Finn and Poe and DJ running across the bridge on the supremacy, and I think we get like a trombone trumpet interplay here. Yeah, as they're running across the bridge over the bottomless chasm with no handrails. Yep, exactly. And again, we get that um, that same incidental motif that we've gotten mm -hmm. all throughout these minutes. And yep. this is the this is the thread, and it's a little bit it's a little bit chain it's a little bit different in the trombone, and I, and I'm not sure why, but it works. So it it is. <laughs> so the tr basically it's like the trumpet. I'll do it here. The trumpet is. And the trombone is almost that, but it's, can, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's and like, it's a little, and it's, it's a little more heavily accented when they're doing. It's a lot, a little more attack on it when the trombones are doing it. Yeah, like, and, and they're pop, not pop, together. Pop, pop. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're not exactly together. It's, a, it's the trombone first, and then the trumpet. Yeah, and it's a, it's a little more staccato with the trombones, a little more separated. Oh yeah, yeah, good point. And the, it's different like angles that we're seeing with each of them. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, so that's all I had for these these minutes. What is yeah. your take on like other trombone? What are your other favorite trombone spots in the Last Jedi? Anything else to call our attention to? Um, you know, like I said earlier, I'm not as familiar with uh, the the newer films. Um, obviously, there's we get the trombones get some great stuff whenever there's big brass fanfares. Like the March of the Resistance has some great trombone stuff in it. How many trombones um, do you think they used? Uh, I think I actually know the answer to this because my teacher at Long Beach State, uh, it was in the orchestra. Oh. Uh, Bill Reichenbach uh, played bass trombone on this. And I think it was probably four, maybe th uh, maybe three on some cues, but it, it's generally a, a standard orchestral size uh trombone section a lot of scores nowadays use a whole lot of trombones my my first trombone teacher played on uh, some of the spider-man movies and they had sections as large as 12 trombones for certain parts of it oh wow yeah um it, it, that when you when you use a large trombone section like that on a film score a lot of times it's because it's there you're using the trombones as percussion you're hitting you know bum mm. bum you know that kind of stuff whereas john williams writes like more classically so he uses a more orchestral trombone section i don't think he ever uses more than four trombones wow okay and then he uh, says them really well his, yeah yeah and then uh and then uh you know one or two tubas and then uh where where john williams uses a lot is i think there's usually large french horn sections Mm -hmm. in his stuff yeah that yeah he is yeah he is into that oh. because he's a very romantic composer yes and, and romantic composers love horns yeah that's true horns and oboes mm -hmm. but, but yeah the, the but you know uh yeah I, I think i think for for the the sequel trilogy it was generally three or four trombones okay okay cool um is there anything about trombones or the last jedi or these minutes that you didn't get to talk about that you want to bring up no i think we managed to get to everything uh, at one point or another yeah we covered a wide range of topics um <laughs> i enjoyed your takes on the virtual instrument stuff that's like something i'm always really curious about um the state yeah that, that was one of the things that led me to not want to be a composer is i didn't want to write for virtual instruments yeah I, that's why, um, that's a big reason I didn't want to become a media composer personally. And that also, I wasn't really a very good composer. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> uh, well, 
I guess you get to save money on all the sample libraries that you would have to buy because those <laughs> really add up yeah. when you have to. Like, okay, so if, if uh, I'm for those listening who don't know what we're talking about, like, you know, a lot of scores these days are performed using computer you, computer instruments, like virtual instruments. And a lot of the times, and that's not intrinsically necessarily bad. Like, it, libraries exist to um, that sound like real instruments and it can be great like as a learning tool like composers do mock-ups before they get to record with the orchestra like it can be a great compositional tool etc so I'm not you know trying to say that, like using those is always bad just saying that like when you compose for media uh, you know at least in this century um, you are usually going to be expected to utilize your instrument libraries so that means you, <laughs> just on a practical note, you end up having to buy a lot of these libraries of instrument sounds. So it can really add Very up in price. True. It can really add up in price if you are like, you know, trying to buy one woodwind library from here. And then, you know, no one has, no one I know who's in this profession has just like one instrument library. It's like they have a several, lots of different string libraries to pick from for different uses. Um, yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing, and it's not cheap. No, it's not cheap. <laughs> All right. Well, Adam, where can people find you if they want to? Um, learn if you, you want to uh, follow me on the social medias, um, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for some reason at uh, Big Bass Bone. That's B I G B A S S B O N E. Um, right now, musically, I'm uh, involved with a uh, folk band called the Poxy Boggards. Uh, we perform at the Southern California Renaissance Fair, and uh, we're very uh, blue. So, How do you spell uh, that? You can follow Poxy Boggards, P-O-X-Y-B-O-G-G-A-R-D-S. And uh, we are very not safe for work in terms of language. Oh, cool. But Good I to sing know. <laughs> and play. I sing and play sack button, that band. Uh, did you say sack button? Sack butt. That's oh. the, uh, the Renaissance form of the trombone. Oh. Oh, yes. Okay. I, I do remember seeing this in scores. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a whole linguistic uh, etymology reason that it's called a sack butt in the Renaissance and Eng in the English Renaissance, and then it becomes a trombone later, but that's, that's a long story. Oh my, is it actually a separate instrument or is it? No, it, it's pretty, it's pretty much the same instrument. Just the, the construction techniques have uh, changed over the centuries. Okay. Got it. Definitely going to Google this. Um, cool. Um, any other places? Oh, you said Twitter. You said TikTok. I definitely. Um... And Instagram. It's, it's all the same handle. Big bass bone. Okay, cool. Because cool. I play a big bass trombone. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a. I'm surprised that handle wasn't taken, but it's taken by you now. Um, yeah, well, yeah. bass bone on Twitter was taken, and I'm still mad at that guy because he never tweeted. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Chrysanthi Tan or um, at Star Wars Musemen on Twitter. And um, let's see, I'm also, okay, if you're listening to this podcast in the podcast player, which most people do, um, now that I know how to check my stats, most people are listening on Apple Podcasts, um, and you want to see things uh, like examples, uh, you can watch also on YouTube. Uh, and let's see, what else? Where else can you, where else can you listen? Uh, I don't know. You can listen wherever you feel is best because I will try not to ever, um, I don't ever want people to feel pressured to watch it on YouTube. <laughs> a couple people have apologized to me for not watching on YouTube and it really is, is fine. I am purposely am not putting up like lots of visuals because I don't want it to be dependent on um, whether you're looking at the screen or not. But there are captions. No, no one wants to see my face anyway. But... <laughs> But on uh, YouTube, I do put um, captions and I do edit them. So if you, so if, if captioned um, listening is easier for you, then um, yeah, that's why I wanted to plug YouTube. That's all I have for today. Um, thank you so much for listening and sharing the show. And thank you to Adam for this fascinating discussion. And I will thank see you, you next. Thank you. I had a great time. Yay. I'm glad. Um, I learned so much from you. Uh, everyone else, I'll see you next week on Star Wars Music Minute.